Hi everyone and welcome once again to one of our Hobby Memorial Library events. We are so excited to have a repeat performer um, in our military history series. We have Colonel Retired Renita Miniheart, Mini Hurt, sorry. Um, of uh, She is a military journalist for 33 years and she had an amazing story, military story last semester we have her again for this semester and we're talking with her and hopefully we'll get one every semester with her. So I'm going to go ahead and um, let you take it away, Renita. All right. Thank you so much. They couldn't know it then, but for some Americans serving in Operation Market Garden, the invasion of Holland that began on September 17th, 1944. This will be the last time they deploy into a major World War II battle. The last time they share a foxhole, eat sea rations, and tell stories about home. The last time they barter for clean socks, cigarettes, chocolate, and for the very last time, read and pray together from their pocket Bibles. Just regular routine army stuff that soldiers do to keep going. So it's appropriate. They're all still together in the Netherlands American Cemetery and Memorial. Located in what is the only American burial site in Holland is a noble, majestic, 101 foot high memorial bell tower, 24 seven, every half hour on the half hour, it alternately chimes, God bless America and America the beautiful. Approximately 8,288 graves stand before the tower. They belong mostly to the airmen and paratroopers of the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions. 160 of the crosses read, Comrades in Arms, known but to God, and 40 sets of brothers rest side by side. Nearby is the Court of Honor, it lists the names of 1,722 soldiers who fought and were killed here, but never found. Engraved in the wall are these words. Here are the names of Americans who gave their lives in service of their country and sleep in unknown graves. I first became acquainted with what is also known as the Margraten Cemetery. This is the town where it's located back in 1999. I was accompanying veteran paratroopers returning to commemorate the 55th anniversary of the invasion of Holland. On the way to the burial ground that morning, they were describing that long ago Sunday in September as a paratrooper's combat jump, fantasy come true, because the weather is absolutely perfect. A shining sun with no clouds, no rain, no wind. One veteran compared it to floating down from heaven, because in spite of all the extra heavy equipment he's carrying, he lands right on his feet. Best of all, no enemy forces are shooting at them yet. They also discussed and in length the details of the private memorials they had been planning for the friends that didn't make it back. Learning about the first overseas World War II cemetery I was about to visit and hearing such devotion from these men it left me overwhelmed. 
and with a desire to also contribute something this day. So I thought, because I don't personally know anyone buried here in the time allotted, I'll go and visit as many graves as I can, say their names, see where they're from, see if there's anybody from Texas, and profusely praise them for doing their duty, serving their country, and assure them they are not and will never ever be forgotten. I had no idea the promise I just made was about to materialize in a way I could have never imagined. I hadn't gone very far when this woman came brushing past me and I couldn't help but notice her for several reasons. First, it was her clothes. Although she was decked out in her Sunday best, the outfit was just out of place somehow. This was a solemn, somber occasion. We'd just come from hearing the Margaret mayor give a very moving tribute to the Americans who fought and were killed here and the returning veterans and their families. This lady, however, has a beautiful smile, just lit up her whole face. And despite her advanced years, she still had that spring in her step. I remember thinking, definitely a woman with a purpose. The oddest thing of all was this medium bag she's pulling along beside her. Couldn't imagine what was in it. Luckily, she stopped about four or five graves down and began pulling things out. The first was a World War II paratrooper jacket in mint condition. She had obviously taken excellent care of it, and it looked like it just came out of the cleaners, all neatly pressed patches and badges in the proper places, and the brass just dazzling, polished to perfection. Very, very lovingly, she draped the jacket around the horizontal arms of the cross and placed an overseas garrison cap on top. Then she pulled out a beautiful quilt and she made, oh, I'm sure she made it. And she made quite the ceremony of spreading it out, patting it down till it's just right. Then came all kinds of memorabilia. What I assumed were family pictures. What looked like might be old high school, college yearbooks. There was even this old Cupid doll and I thought, oh, he won that for her at some carnival and she's held on to it all this time. The last item sent me scrambling for a handkerchief. It would not be the first time that day. It was a bottle of champagne she held up. I just knew this was left over from their wedding and she'd saved it all these years just for this occasion. Now I can't do this. But she uncorked it herself, poured the champagne into two beautiful, exquisite crystal glasses, and made what I can only describe as an eloquent toast to her young soldier there. I'd have given anything to have heard the words. Afterwards, she placed one of the glasses in front of the cross and then seated herself with the other. And that was the moment I knew the lady is on a date. And then it all made sense. The clothes, they were from the forties. And I fantasized this must have been what she was wearing when they met. Maybe when he proposed, maybe the last time they were together. By now, the journalist in me is kicking and screaming to go over there and learn all I can about the lady and her date. See if any of my suppositions are correct. But a good, responsible journalist knows when not to intrude. 
To do so now would have been unforgivable. This was their moment, and only their moment. So I continued on my own mission, got a finance soldier from Texas. But I told myself, let's keep an eye on her. And if I feel the time is right to barge in, oh yes, I will grab it. Meanwhile, there are countless private memorials taking place all over the cemetery. Equally as impressive are the gifts being brought. If you're a paratrooper, you're getting a brand new pair of jump boots. Everybody's getting a set of dog tags with the old P-38 can opener attached. I have never seen gourmet baskets of food like I did that day. And two soldiers buried next to each other really lucked out. They both received the most scrumptious looking home baked pies. Blueberry was the favorite flavor of 44, so I'm guessing that's what kind it was. But even if I'm wrong, I'm sure they enjoyed every bite. And liquor, whiskey, bourbon, rum, gin, beer, quite the celebration. I'm sure that was enjoyed as well. The most touching were the pocket Bibles being placed on the graves by returning veteran and active duty chaplains. Later on when we talked, they explained how whenever soldiers deployed, and this is still true today, they pass out these small Bibles for that special GI pocket. This is where they store those letters from home, a girlfriend's picture, a favorite snack they don't want to share, and that pocket Bible. And one point the chaplains were adamant about, it never mattered what religion anybody was. Those GIs want that pocket Bible on them at all times, because as soldier philosophy clearly mandates, there are no atheists in a foxhole. I did keep watch on our date lady. Every time I look, she's laughing, talking, sipping champagne, just having a great time. All too soon it's time to leave, and I'm sorely disappointed, but not for long. I have been traveling with these gentlemen about two or three days to Holland. Along the way, they had asked to stop and see certain areas, especially the memorials along the road. Then every night after dinner, they would congregate, talk about what they'd seen, why it meant so much. The Margraten Cemetery was our first major stop in a two and a half week journey to the European World War II battlefields, burial grounds, various cities, villages, uh, all kinds of places. So I got to thinking, tonight should be really something. And maybe one of them knows who this woman is. Sure enough, as soon as the dinner dishes were collected, one veteran immediately stood up and proposed a toast. Gentlemen, here's to our fellow paratroopers in that airborne heaven in the sky. May God bless us and keep us safe until we're all together again. And then came the stories about those left behind. I got to tell you, these were the most entertaining, hair-raising, off-the-wall army adventures I'd ever heard of until then. And we don't have time for them all here, but this one quickly became my favorite, and I thought you might enjoy it. Alan and I were best friends. We grew up on adjoining farms. I was the quiet, shy guy in the corner, while Alan was boisterous, loud, overbearing. We always usually did whatever he commanded. When we graduate from high school, 
in June of 1942. Allen declared it was time for us to join the paratroopers, but we're only 16 years old and not likely to get parental consent. No big deal. Alan simply doctored our birth certificates and we were off. When we're presented with those highly prestigious silver airborne wings and killer looking jump boots, nothing will do but we have to go to town and celebrate. However, none of us have enough money for taxis back and forth. Once again, Alan comes through. He simply volunteered somebody's car and we all piled in. Must have been 15 of us. Even had guys on the ceiling and on the hood. We get to this dance. Not one young lady turned us down. There were even a few marriage proposals. Alan always insisted it was the wings and the boots. So I wasn't too surprised this morning when Alan shared with me that when he and the other guys from our unit made that last parachute landing fall, PLF we call it, and landed at the gates of that army airborne heaven in the sky, and were greeted by our dear Heavenly Father, Alan quickly spoke up, Lord, mansions and banquets, yeah, they sound just great, but the fellows and I took a vote. We'd like to live in the barracks where we first met. What became our refuge after long, hard hours of all that brutal training? Where we came to confide in one another. Where we came to know we could trust each other for our lives. Where we literally became brothers, closer than family. And this time, how about putting the mess hall right beside us? We don't want to have to double time three miles down the road whenever there is a banquet. And Lord, we're paratroopers. We absolutely love jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. So how about some C-47s? The aircraft we jumped out of into Normandy and Holland. How about making them available 24-7? so we can jump whenever we like. Uh, soft landings, guaranteed every time. According to Alan, Lord said, hey, no problem with one stipulation. I get to jump with you. And according to Alan, that's quite a bit. When the story started to fade and it was getting quiet, that's when I jumped up and asked if anyone knew of the woman in the cemetery this morning who brought her husband's uniform and all the memorabilia. Two of the veterans had been coming back since 1949. So had she. They knew the story quite well. It turned out the young paratrooper buried there was simply her fiance. They never had the chance to marry raise some children, and grow old together. She resumed her life in the small Midwestern town they were both from, but chose not to enter into another personal relationship. It was enough for her to come back every year on this day and celebrate it in this same fashion. In 1999, that was date number 50. I like believing she's been there every year since, including this one, which would make it date 74. The evening didn't end there. These wild, tantalizing tales of their fallen comrades had brought them back to life. Even I could feel their presence. And the journey back to a time and place that was certainly a significant event in their young lives, especially those returning for the first time. Here's that opportunity to reconcile themselves with all that happened, good as well as bad, and find that peace and closure to go forward. I think it was the best medicine in the world for them all. 
And I think it was a combination of all these things that led to a very lively discussion, which in turn led to a sort of proposal or decree that prompted them to jump up and cheer, applaud, and drink to several times. On this day, and I think this applied to all the burial grounds we visited, on this day in the Margrat Cemetery, it didn't matter which side of the cross you were on. Each and every word of each and every conversation was heard and enjoyed by both parties. I know it's true because I found that soldier from Texas. Private First Class Frank W. Hayes Jr., 101st Airborne Division. I distinctly heard him ask me in that endearing Texas drawl, ma'am, you available for a little Texas two-step in this evening? I know he heard me say, you bet, soldier. Just tell me where and when. Before I close, I would like to encourage everyone to come up and take a closer look at the picture poster I brought with me. I want you to see just how beautiful the Margraten Cemetery is. And this is thanks to the Dutch. Every grave there has been adopted by a Dutch family. Some families are responsible for numerous graves. And no matter what time of year you go there, you'll see them working on the grass, taking care of the flowers, having their own private memorial service. And it's quite the family affair. Grandparents, parents, children, aunts, uncles, cousins. The story's been handed down from one generation to the next about their liberation thanks to the Allies. And they love to come up and talk to Americans. I was pleasantly surprised at how good their English is. The gentlemen you see pictured around the poster, they're the veterans I went back to Margraten with that day. We go back together on a few more occasions. They're all in that airborne heaven in the sky now. I am looking forward to reconnecting with them someday. I'm even hoping they'll let me jump with them. I want to thank everybody for listening, and I will be glad to answer any questions. Thank you all. Let me go ahead and show the poster. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the people in the pictures? Okay. Like I said, those are my veterans. Um, this was quite the crew. Uh, if we start on the bottom right, you may remember this name, Bob Wright. He was the gentleman I featured on the last time who helped all the Germans and Americans who were injured in the Angleville church after landing in Normandy. Uh, the next is Frank Gagliano, a very favorite one of mine. He was out of Long Island, New York. And uh, Frank, his story, this is really amazing. When he first joined up and he was with the paratroopers and got to Fort Bragg, he didn't like the idea of flying in any of these, what they call the flying coffin and the gliders. And he refused to get on it. And it raised such a fuss, the commanding officer came down to see what was going on. And Frank explained the situation and the officer said, how about you and I take a ride together? We come out safe, no more fussing. Frank agreed <laughs> and he did make it into Normandy and lived it afterwards. He also went through uh, not only Margraten, but the Battle of the Bulge as well. And the next one, Hank Tafoya. Uh, Hank was with the 504th, 82nd. He shared with me some incredible stories out of Italy. Now the 504th did not go on the invasion because of their time there in that country. It had been very, very taxing and just, I would say the word is hair raising, but Hank lived through it all. And what I love about him, 
we were going through uh, a lot of the old towns there um, that were uh, defended and attacked during, that were occupied by the Germans during Market Garden. And lo and behold, he found the name of uh, one of his friends that had been killed there that he had not thought of in years. And nothing would do, but we had to stop and bless his heart. He said a very simple prayer for his friend there. And of course, we all joined in. And Murray Morehouse out of Michigan, can't remember the town. Murray, <laughs> uh, Murray wanted to be a professional soldier. When World War II started, that was his chance. But again, he's only 16 years old. A lot of them were. He also fixed his birth certificate so he could get in. However, Murray did not like the first two units he was in. He thought that they were just, there was not enough action going on. So he simply went AWOL and joined the paratroopers. And there he found that challenging, brutal training that he really wanted. And uh, the night of the invasion, when it was first called off, he was very upset. Here he's gone through all this and he's ready to go and you're telling me, never mind, you gotta be kidding me. And he didn't want to go back to the hangar and take everything off. So he asked them, could he just sit there in the plane? And yeah, no, everybody off. But Murray went on to serve in Normandy. He fought in what they call, uh, it's believed to be the fiercest small arms battle of Normandy. And that is at the Fior Bridge. It went on for three days and uh, to this day, he could not remember anything other than fighting, not eating, not sleeping, not taking a break to go relieve yourself, just constant fighting. And after the battle was over, he, they were marching down to Utah Beach. And he said, you know, I think we all felt those that didn't make it marching with us. The next one is Alan McDonald out of Oklahoma. And Alan, I truly admired. He had one of those Oklahoma draws that just didn't stop. And uh, I would love to tell the story. You may have to edit this out. This is very politically incorrect. Can we handle that? <laughs> um, <coughs> Alan, Go for it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Alan. Uh, another farm boy. And what I want you to understand about a lot of these soldiers, those that grew up out in the middle of nowhere and had not been around a lot of women. There were only boys in his graduating class as well. And uh, he had never been more than 10 miles down the road. And he and his best friend had joined up together. Now they had never seen the big city New York City until they are sailing out of there. <laughs> and uh, so this is all very, very new to them. And then when they get to England, they're training around the clock. And again, it's very taxing. But because he and his best friend did so well, the platoon leader gave them two passes to go to London for the weekend. And of course, they've heard in the barracks from other GIs all the wonderful things that could happen to an American soldier in London. Well, they get there <coughs> and there's a buzz bomb attack and they have to go into the tunnels or the subways there. Now, not only is it very dark, it's very, very hot. And then everybody's dying of thirst. But they start talking and I think a great many soldiers do this about, you know, we're not going to make it. Yeah, I know. Well, what do you want to do before it's all over with? I know. What do you want to do? Well, because they're so thirsty, they make a pact that even though they're underage, they're going to go to a bar and be served a cold beer. That's all they want to do before it's over with. Well, they finally get out of the subway, only now it's nighttime and the blackout's in effect. So it's still dark. However, their luck got a little better because they ran into two English ladies who said, follow us, yike, we'll get you the beer. So they get into this bar, and here's where it gets politically incorrect. Uh, Alan thought these were the two ugliest 
women he'd ever seen in his life. <laughs> but his friend Norman uh, fell madly in love with one of them. And what was kind of even bad, uh, because soap and water is, you know, uh, it's, it's handed out now because of all that's going on. They smell very bad. But Norman fell madly in love with this one gal and they start courting and he proposes marriage and he even put her in touch back with his mother in Oklahoma. Now here comes the invasion and they do live through it and they get to St. Mary Glace on some downtime. That's when Norman discovers French girls only he's got this fiance back in London. So his solution is to go and steal the company commander's stationery. And he says, Alan, you have to write the letter because she'll recognize my handwriting. So they concoct this letter that goes, dear Miss So-and-so, the Department of the Army regrets to inform you that uh, Private Norman Baker was killed in action during the invasion. <laughs> Now, it didn't end there. The girl decided the mother should have the letter. So she sends it back to her in Oklahoma. The mother is astounded because no one told her. And back then they had four days, now we have four hours. So she calls the War Department in Washington, screaming bloody murder. And the next thing they know, the FBI shows up in the compound looking for them. <laughs> And Alan thought he was going to Sing Sing Prison along with his friend because he's the one that forged the company commander's signature. <laughs> so that's my story about two soldiers, you know, leaving home for the first time and they're in the middle of the war. So I think you can understand this somewhat. Um, I'm not sure who this is at the top. Let me see. Oh, oh, oh okay. Uh, on the far right at the top, this is uh, a man named O.B. Hill, uh, truly Owen Bruce. This gentleman is one of the ones that have been going back since 1949. It became a real passion with him, and he formed the 82nd Airborne Association and hunted down those that had served and urged them to come back every year and make that pilgrimage. Now, I think I got him. Yeah, that was number 50. And my story about him, I finally got a hold of him. And I said, are you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll be glad to be interviewed. Do you mind if we ride with my friend back to the hotel? You know, we're good friends and, and we've been chatting and I don't want to leave. Oh, yeah, I had no problem. Well, it would have been fine, except the friend was driving 99 miles an hour. And I get terribly car sick. And it's kind of, I mean, we're just going like this. And this poor man is filling all this out and he would get a little teary eyed and say, can we stop for a minute, which was fine with me because I'm hanging my head out that window going, okay, now where were we? But luckily I made it without getting sick. Now, Obi Hill became quite a favorite in St. Mary Glace. Uh, so much so he had the key to his home, own room there, bedroom with the mayor's house. That's how much he was revered there. And after we talked, he didn't lose touch, not with any of us, them I didn't, because there were times I would be working on a story and I'd want to pick their brains. And they were more than willing to talk to me about anything I was interested in. And it's thanks to all of them um, that these stories got to be as well written as they were. I owe it all to them. Now, gentlemen at the far left, and pardon me, he is still living. Steve Mrozik runs two World War II museums in Michigan. He's a reenactor, historian, everything. Another good one I like to call and get clarification on things. But that, I think this was my second time to Mark Rotten with him. He had found a soldier that he had done some research on and acquired some of his uh, World War II equipment. I believe it was his helmet, uh, his canteen, various items. So he came and got me and said, would you come out here with me to see, uh, his name is Robert Thornton, let me say. So I, yeah, I'll go out there with you. 
this was a little emotional finding somebody that you've written about and heard about and even have their equipment. So you see him kneeling there saying a prayer and it was quite touching. He was letting him know, you know, I heard what a good soldier you were and um, I've got your, by the way, I found your helmet in somebody's attic here in Holland, <laughs> but it's on display for all to see in my museum now. Uh, just a wonderful, you know, one of those heartbreaking stories you run into. So Steve and I still go back together on occasion, and um, probably our first step is we go to the cemeteries, and then we like to go to the museums that are there. And of course, you see that beautiful bell tower there where they do. I was amazed uh, when they run those two songs back to back. You can't help but feel the pride and joy of being an American and how we help this country. And you see how they feel about us. Is that enough information for you? That is amazing. All right, Renita, you are a gold mine of keeping our military history alive. And so we thank you again for amazing stories. We hope you will consider coming to do this every semester for Absolutely. us. Um, coming up, I shame on me, I'd forgotten this. It is the 75th anniversary of the Berlin Airlift. And this is another thing that came about after World War II. And I think it's one of America's greatest achievements. And I never want anybody to forget that one. So that's our next subject. Well, being a military journalist and knowing all these stories, you are giving a gift to our college, to our community, um, to our military students and faculty and staff. And we just want you to keep going because you are just, um, you are the uh, the embodiment of military history. So well, thank you anytime. Thank you. All right, and everyone, um, we won't. We don't have any major events going on, but every Tuesday we have our Makerspace Tuesdays. So make sure that you come on into the library and um, do some crafts every week with us. All right. Renita, thank you again, and we will see you guys next time. Okay. You guys have a great day. Have a great day yourself. Bye-bye. you.